So today we're going to have a uh, special presentation from uh, David Ig. So David Ig is uh, a colleague of, of ours in the program. It was actually one of the people I had had uh, had uh, in our uh, advisory, you could say, uh, when we were developing the program. And, and back in the very start of, of uh, these courses, the uh, Strategic Foresight Innovation Program had originally uh, two systems thinking courses. Jeremy's, Jeremy had the understanding systems, and I was developing uh, the social systems design course. So then in 2008, 2009, and I was also teaching human factors, innovation research methods, I couldn't teach three. So David was the first person I asked to teach, but he was working, he was still at IBM, starting at finishing up at Northwestern, and I believe at the time, we're talking almost 10 years ago, 2008, 2009, yeah. 2017. So David's uh, finishing up uh, a PhD at Alpha University, where he has also been teaching since then. So David was pretty busy back then, but we were able to get him in, um, to, to, to bring him in for kind of an annual lecture on uh, an area that, that he's been developing his PhD and his uh, consulting work on the service systems uh, design as the systems thinking principles and methods, uh, some theory, the application of that theory of, in, in more principles. So, uh, so I think it's probably fair to say there, uh, you look, your David's talk today, you'll be getting probably a lot of ideas that could apply in, in your future applications. You may not be able to see an immediate fit to the system projects you're working on yet, but consider how they will. I know that we're still working on, uh, with some teams, the selection of, of you know, the final selection of your uh, wicked problem and how it's going to be mapped out. After the break, we'll uh, start, we'll have a, uh, like an hour long studio. Uh, Jeremy will be here today and uh, we'll use the, the second half of, of the course to uh, work with your teams on uh, kicking off the synthesis now. So right now, uh, I'll turn it over to uh, David. And, and, Okay, can introduce himself from here. Okay, so um, firstly, uh, so Peter has posted <coughs> both of the slides. Last night I added one slide, which doesn't really make a difference, but if you want to find the slide, it's at coolballon.com slash com slash publications. And, uh, and you can download it there. It really doesn't make a difference. Um, so I want to tell a little bit about um, uh, Peter. Peter said that um, when we first met, it was a really interesting circumstance <laughs> because um, was at IBM. I retired from playing golf at IBM. But uh, I got this email from Peter, and the, and the content of the email is probably going to be the lecture you get next week. And he was doing research into language action, and he, he had this. And so he sent me his email and said, "I noticed that you um, you travel a lot. You seem to come through Toronto pretty often. You know, I haven't found anyone else that has actually blogged about language action." My response was, I live in Toronto, I just travel a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Which explains why I'm at Alto University in Finland finishing a PhD. For those of you doing grad studies, um, this is my second time doing a PhD. And so uh, I started my PhD in Finland in 2003. But the first time I was working on my PhD, I was uh, in between 1982 and 1984 at the University of British Columbia. Um, and to, to give you guys a point of reference, a book I read recently, I don't know if anyone's heard about The Undoing Project uh, by Michael Lewis, which is about um, uh, Danny Kahneman. Um, that for me is history of science because towards the end of that book, there's a discussion about Danny Kahneman being at University of British Columbia, and so I actually had a course with Danny Kahneman. So I get the distinction of being one of the people of history in class with a PhD uh, with a uh, Nobel laureate. So that's great. Um, anyway, so I've been around this for a long time, um, and uh, I also record my lectures, and so uh, you find me on YouTube. Um, this lecture is actually uh, different from the lecture that I gave two and three years ago. Uh, Peter keeps me pretty sharp by having the uh, RSD conference. I was going to the Relating System Thinking and Design conferences, 
And I use that as part of an extension of this community to figure out what I should be saying. And so uh, the talk that I've given previously to this class was seven, in fact, seven things that you should thinking, be thinking about when you do system thing. Since then, I've moved. Um, and uh, the, the major uh, direction that I've been taking has been on generative pattern language. And I'll get into what that is. But the presentation for that and the culmination of this, so this has nothing to do with the PhD, actually. It's a completely separate research project. The culmination of this was a presentation at the end of October that I gave at the University of San Francisco at the, at the uh, Pearl Conference. Now, Pearl is the Portland Urban Architecture Research Center. This is Portland, Oregon. So I'm at an architecture conference presenting stuff. Right? So I get around all these different communities. Uh, um, Two years ago, I went to the industrial ecology meeting, and I, I, go, I go to conferences and try to figure out where all these different fields and all these all these ideas are coming from, and I synthesize them in a different way. So I, I uh, after giving that class, um, I gave I did a lecture in Finland at the beginning of December that was a branch from the theoretical work. So so if you see the the, the paper that I had done in the publications list um, in. October, it's it's readable, but it's incredible work. Um, in our, in December, I took that and made it a little workshop. Um, had three hours to do that. I don't have that much time to do it today, so I'm going to do a, a shorter version of that. Um, but the the name of this talk is reflecting on acts of representation. So you've been asked to come to this class with the system thinking. Um, you're like halfway into the class now. I see what you've been reading. So you're reading John T. Your doggy book and stuff like that. So here we got a good idea. But you're still trying to figure out what system thinking is. Um, you know, you kind of get this intuition. It's kind of like intuitive, but not intuitive. And so I was, I was thinking as Peter um, has coached me to be more practical in the stuff I'm doing. Um, what is it that actually happens when you do system thinking and how does it impact the research work we've been about to do in back of our time? The word representation is important here because representation is you taking ideas in and representing them out. So what's happening is that there's this world out there, you're taking it in and you're presenting it back to people who haven't thought about it as much. And so you're doing this act of representation. And so some ideas resonate, some ideas don't. But what you're doing is that you're taking a systemic lens and looking at the world and saying, look at the world this way. Okay, so what does that actually mean when you're actually looking for a systems thinker? So as people ask me um, about systems thinking and uh, uh, and they say, how do you know if you've actually met a system thinker? And this is one of the intuitive things that I've discovered. Uh, you know, I go to a party, I talk to someone, and I said, oh, I used to be president of the International Society of Sciences, the System Science, System Thinking Organization. The guy said, oh, I'm a system thinker. And as I'm talking to them, it's like, wow, this guy knows nothing about systems. These guys know nothing about systems. And you kind of get that idea, um, and I hope maybe in, by the middle of this presentation you may get some intuitions on how um, I present and talk about systems and it may help you to think about things. So I'm going to cover, and uh, I have 90 minutes. In theory I'm going to cover five points. If I get through four of them, it's really, really good. Okay, so we'll see how far we get. And I'm going to have to watch in time. So you can stop me any time. If you have anything going on in your head, just stop me and, and uh, I'll clarify. Um, but uh, we're going to talk about these things. Um, and I put these as ways in shifting about the world when we think about systems. Because different people think about systems in different ways. And one of the interesting things you're going to find, and th these are real details. So um, I did have a career 28 years at IBM. Um, so as much as uh, it's, it's really funny coming and giving talks, because there's two types of talks I give. I did this once. Um, at a system science conference, and my sons were there. And so my sons came and they heard the first talk, and they go, Wow, we didn't know that you could be a lecturer and talk. You know, and it's like, Yeah, because at IBM, you know, you probably have to give 
presentations to vice presidents all the time. So, you know, it's not that I can't be clear. And then they came to the second talk and they go, wow, that was the most boring talk ever. <laughs> and that's because that's a research talk. So there's research and there's teaching, which are two different things. I'm very, very precise in that when I look at things, if I'm going to be rigorous about things, I think about going to code, writing software. So when you see this and you see two-way arrows and one-way arrows, there's a very fine distinction that I'm making, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what they mean, but that's a little cue of representation. What does it mean to have a two-way arrow as opposed to a one-way arrow? Okay, start off with a talk here with this topic. Um, architecture and design, so you're in a design program. Um, what is the difference between architecting and design? Anyone? Use these words every day, right? Your design program. Why are you required to an architecture program? Is it architecture a subset of design? Okay. If you're an architect, you're probably a designer, but if you're a designer, you're not a subset of design. Good. Okay. So there's an idea, and I'm going to make a distinction. This comes from 1969. This is the architecture community. In 1969, there's the idea of architectural programming. Architectural programming, um, and they had what they called problem seeking. The idea was you have problem seeking, problems worth solving. You would have problem solving, solving the problem, and then you have the solution, right? <coughs> so at that time, it said design is problem solving, programming is problem seeking. So if we take that architectural view, architecting is about looking for problems to solve. Designing is about solving those problems. I don't know if any of you have read about architecture, know architects. I mean, there, every once in a while you read, you read about this architect that does stuff like putting a uh, building on the side of a mountain. And they talk about, well, you know, anyone can design a building. I'm looking for an architectural challenge worth solving. They're doing problem seeking. Are there problems worth solving? It's not the problems in the world. Which ones are worth solving? So this is a distinction that I make that a lot of architecture, and this gets run down. Uh, uh, my friend David Hawk and at New Jersey Institute of Technology was in both architecture and in management. And so he was talking, he always runs this down and say, well, architectural programming has turned into a really bad sort of thing because what has turned into is requirements analysis, which is not really what it was all about. The idea was, what is the problem you're trying to, what, how, did, how is it that you find better problems? This is one of the things that we do in systems thinking, is we recognize there's a lot of problems in the world, but which ones are really worth solving? If you can seek out a problem, that is somehow more fundamental, deeper, and you fix one of those, it could fix all the rest. So Russell Acoff, and you've been reading um, John Sheed, Garrett Doggy work, John Sheed was um, a consultant working for um, Russell Acoff his entire career. And so um, in, in Acoff terminology, you can solve a problem, you can also dissolve the problem. So those of you who have children, multiple children, and you have a toy and they're fighting over the toy, what is the solution? You have two kids fighting over a toy. Destroy the toy. Yes. yes. <laughs> Destroying is pretty extreme, but yes, taking the toy away will dissolve the problem. Yeah, destroying it is the ultimate, I guess. One way, one way through to it. So uh, this idea that architecting is about problem seeking rather than problem solving. And so following through with your comment, uh, all architecture is design, but not all design is architecture. And so reading through the literature, there is the idea of architectural thinking as shaping the structure of the environment. Okay, so let's pick up here. Environment is a system term, 
right? You have system and environment. So this is actually a really good definition that says, okay, architects work on the environment. They don't work on the system per se. They should be working on the environment. Of course, the system goes in the environment. But when you actually are in the environment, it's different from being inside the system. Design thinking, the usual sort of, uh, of uh, things that you read, you can try to, what is design thinking. Uh, one of the ideas is about divergent steps, creating choices, and convergent steps, making choices. Okay. So let's go a little bit deeper on system thinking, which is there is two big words that are a little hard to untangle, um, which is, uh, and here's the definition, living systems are autopoietic. <coughs> Poiesis is creation, and so this means self-creation. A living system is self-organizing and self-generating. This, you know, what, now what you don't usually hear when you actually read, because you, you may have heard if you're in the knowledge management literature or you hear Ron Ron and Varela, you always hear autopoiesis, autopoiesis, autopoiesis. Which is always interesting because people in knowledge management that use the word autopoiesis do not have the blessing of Macharana. Macharana says, autopoiesis has nothing to do with knowledge management. If you guys are talking about social systems, I was talking about biological systems, but there's a problem right there. But the question is, if, it, if you're not looking at an auto wedding system, what type of system are you looking at? There are what are called allopoietic systems, which are assembly lines, which are externally organizing and externally generating. Human beings are autopoietic systems, if you have children, right? Uh, because we're self-organizing and self-generating. Now, if organized in couples, uh, it generated a. If you look at an allopoietic system, we have a lot of them. Assembly lines are allopoietic. So, a machine creates something else. Do you have a machine that creates another machine? If you have a machine that created another machine, that would be autopoietic. But most machines create something else. You know, something goes off the end of the assembly line, it's different. It's not self-reproducing. So, why am I making this point? If you are architecting a system, you are implicitly making the choice about whether you are creating a monopoietic system or an allopoietic system. My friend David Clark did his PhD a long time ago under Russ Aikoff. And he was looking at environmental regulation. This is back when they were starting in the 1970s, um, and Sweden was working on stuff. And what he was looking for was a system of regulation. There's two ways of designing a system of regulation when you're doing stuff like um, refrigerators and you know, energy usage, all that sort of stuff. One is to come in with regulation and just say, do this, don't do that. It's laws. The other is to create a system that actually is self-organizing, that encourages people to behave in the right way. So a lot of this work got put into the Energy Star system. Uh, for those of you who have shop for a refrigerator, a refrigerator and appliances have the sticker on the front that says, this, this appliance uses this much energy a year. So if you buy this appliance, it'll be cheaper. So you, 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 you could say, okay, you're looking at the sticker and you go, okay, this refrigerator costs $100 more than the refrigerator next to it, but it uses $50 less energy per year. So in two years, you're going to pay that. That is a system that is designed as autopoietic because the regulation is inside the system itself. Has anyone here seen Stuart Brand's How Buildings Learn? Okay, here's homework for you. Go to YouTube. There is a six-part series, with a six-part series, and uh, it's on YouTube, it's entertaining. It was a production done by Stuart Brand called How Buildings Learn. Um, 
And essentially, back then, um, Stuart Brand, who's, who's um, been running the Long Now Foundation uh, more recently, um, he was looking at the idea of knowledge and how is it we have knowledge management, these sorts of things. But there was no way of studying knowledge at that time. Um, there's no history. That's the problem with, with knowledge management. It's like you're so abstract. So he took, being a systems guy, he took and said, okay, let's look at how buildings learn. What do you mean by buildings learn? Well, there's two ways of looking at a building. One is that you have the occupants of the building, and you have the building, you, you, you have the building, which is a static thing, and the occupants, which are people that change. So the building stays there, and people move in and out. Family yeah, growth, that sort of thing. The other way of looking at it, if you're a systems person, is that let's assume that you have the people and you have the building around the people. So the building is adapting over time. The building is a system. He created this model that was originally called the shearing layer, layer model, and it became updated uh, pacing layers. And the idea here is that you can start off with the site. The site is the foundation for a building. It's always there. It doesn't change. It's like, if you, can, you can change the site. But to move a building off a site, like to jack it up and take the whole building or move it, it's a really big deal. It can be done, but you don't need to do that. What do you do after you have the building? You then put in the structure. The structure is load-bearing walls. Okay. When you're doing the load-bearing walls, um, you have to do that, get the roof up on the top and all that. You then put the skin on the outside. And the skin protects the structure from the weather. Inside of the structure, you have the services in blue. The services are things like plumbing and electricity. Okay. So after you put the walls, the load bearing, you put in all of the facilities that you need to put in, um, heating, HVAC, air conditioning, all sorts of venting. Okay. Now the, the, the one that, uh, one place that uh, Stuart Brand cites different is the Pompidou Center in Paris. The Pompidou Center has the plumbing on the outside of the building, which is not a good idea because it requires a lot of maintenance because now you're putting skin on top of the structure, uh, on top of the services. But, <coughs> you know, you got rust on the outside and put all the paint. So it's usually conventionally the way that you put in the structure first, you put in the services, then you have the space plan. The space plan is non-load bearing walls. So those of you who have done a renovation, it's kind of like, oh, you know, this back wall, can we go through there? Well, yeah, actually we could. We just take out that wall, no big deal. No electric plumbing, nothing behind it, just go straight through it. A space plan divides up the space. And then you have the stuff, which is furniture, called mobilia, you know, kind of Italian. So stuff that moves. And so um, the, the, the idea behind this is truly an architectural view of the world. What's the difference between an armoire and a closet? Mobilia. Mobilia, yes. An armoire is stuff, you can move it, and if you change houses, you can take it with you. You can't take a closet with you. So those of you who are always looking for closets and moving into apartments, like, well, you can't take one, if you like that apartment, the old closets, you're gonna end up with armoires and the new ones because Now what this view does is, it actually is a little bit of a trick in, in thinking about the world because we're talking about systems. And in some respect, and a lot of people think about systems in terms of structure. But this is actually not structure, this is process. Because things change over time. And learning is about changes over time. Okay, so I did the two-headed thing. You kind of got the idea of architecting and designing. So if you're doing the project, one of the decisions you should try to make when you're actually prescribing and telling someone that you're going to do something is, are you doing a design 
which is really kind of more inside the system, or are you doing architecting, which is more outside the system? Okay, we're gonna move now to the idea of service systems. And uh, I've been working for quite a long time on, on service systems and service system science. Um, so in two weeks I'll be in Tokyo and uh, we're having another meeting on the 10th or 11th meeting of service system science for uh, big ideas. And, and if we're not talking about service systems, what are we talking about? Generally production systems. We're very accustomed to talking about production systems and we're not used to talking so much about service systems. So service system science started uh, about 2003-2005 uh, um, and Jim Spore at IBM, um, he was at IBM Research in San Jose, I'm going down to see him next week, uh, he got, got this interesting challenge. Uh, okay, so you're at IBM, you know, the CEO of IBM comes out and says, oh, okay, well, we noticed the shift to a service economy, right, so if you look at government statistics, we're shifted toward the service economy. What's that mean? Oh, well, I'm not really sure. No, okay. Uh, but the statistics say that. Now, IBM, around 10 years ago, uh, for those of you who know the history of IBM, it, was, it made the shift from being what they call a hardware company to being a software and services company. So, more than half of IBM's revenue is coming from services. How much was being spent on research on services? The answer is like nearly zero, like 1% or something like that. So, so this idea came, well, if it's half of our business, are we doing any research in this? And this came up with the idea of service science. And Jim Spore started in 2003. He came to a uh, ISSS meeting, a system science meeting, and presented there. So he's a good system thinker. And what had the system thing underlying? Um, so, my question would be, okay, if there is a service systems orientation now, what would it be in another situation? And you have to actually look back a little bit further. And my question is, is thinking different across agricultural systems, industrial systems, and service systems? So, agricultural systems. Been around for a long time. We still have agricultural systems. Uh, fairly industrialized, but the idea of farming is pretty good. So imagine you were at the Industrial Revolution. There's farms all around, okay? I own a factory, and, uh, and I'm looking for workers. And so I come up and say, uh, okay, so I see you're farming. It's really, really tough work out there. Like, I know you guys learned about the phrase, you know. Okay, so um, I have this proposition for you. Why don't you come work for me? Uh, as opposed to crops that may fail, um, I'll pay you, you know, I'll pay you by the hour, no problem. Um, and uh, you know, and uh, actually, we're, we have good conditions. Um, you know, we uh, have heating in the winters. So you're not going to freeze. Uh, actually, we have air conditioning, so in the summer, great. You know. And uh, we work steady hours. So great. Sounds much better than farming. Much easier. Great. Okay. Come in Monday morning. We start at nine o'clock. He says, "You mean sunrise?" I said, "No, we work nine to five. What, what does it mean to work nine to five when you come from an agricultural system? Farming works sunrise to sunset. So you go to a factory, that means that you lose all those daylight hours, which were productive, and in the winter, you're, you, it was talking Finland, you go to work in the dark and you come home in the dark. Right. So it's like, you know, we were nine to five. So there's a mental shift in the whole world that says industrial systems are different from agricultural systems. What does that mean to be working in a service economy? And you guys are all young enough that you probably have all worked in a service economy. And all are well or will work in a service economy because GDP in Canada is like 80% services. So what's the way to work in a service economy? Well, one answer is you don't really work nine to five. Like if your phone rings at midnight and you look at it, it's like 
oh, it's my biggest client. You know, I answer the phone, it's like, well, it's not between nine and five. Why would this guy call me at midnight and probably answer the phone? Biggest client that could be at a job tomorrow. So there's this idea of time that is different with service systems. And there's a lot of assumptions that come in about what it means to be in a service economy. Now, Jim Spore, when he came presented in 20, 20, 2003, said that he wondered, uh, he thought it would take 10 years to do that. Um, and so by 2013, there's a journal called Service Science. There are conferences on Service Science. Um, they meet at Hawaii in uh, January. I want to go to the Hicks conference. Um, but there's an idea, but we're not very far into a service economy yet. We really don't really understand it that well. And people are still getting a little bit productive on it. So remember I was talking about system thinkers before, and now some will say that they're system thinkers, but they're really not. Um, you read that a lot of journal articles, you go, wow, this is systems, but not exactly the systems I mean. So what's a service system? Uh, Jim got asked, he was at um, in Washington, and got asked, well, if you had a service system education program, how would you teach people differently? And so he came across, gave us the idea, okay, let's structure the uh, schools a little bit differently. So let's start off with the systems that move, store, harvest, and process, okay? So in kindergarten, let's teach kids about transportation systems. So as soon as you take a kid, it's like they could be getting on a bus, they could be walking, they could take a streetcar. You're already educating and putting them on a transportation system. So they understand how to get to school. So there is your first service system. Water and waste management, grade one. When they open the tap and the water comes out, it doesn't come out magically, it comes from somewhere. That is a service system. The kids understand what the water comes from the sky, it falls in the lakes, it goes through the system, it goes through the, uh, the water plant. You can take a one year old, take a grade one kid to a water plant and teach them how that works. Food and global supply chain. People that think that food comes out of a supermarket that's already pre packaged, um, you can take them to a farm, you can take them to different places and show how food moves around the world. Energy and energy grid. Plugging into the wall is something we take for granted. Do people really understand how that works? Information communications infrastructure. By grade four, depends. In Finland, they all have mobile phones by grade four. Like they have mobile phones when they're really young, because it's kind of like the kids might lose. So, uh, but again, it's kind of like this voice that comes out of the world. It's like you just answer this thing. You talk to someone you don't see. It's like wow, it's amazing service. Next set, systems that enable healthy, wealthy, and wise people. Building and construction is a service industry. It's not a manufacturing process industry, and it's one of the world's largest industries, and people don't pay attention to it. It's a service system. Take kids to a site and say, this is how buildings are built. Look at how the people work. Why is it you have these tradesmen coming in, and then they go away, and you know all these things happening simultaneously? Banking and finance, that's the one that people tend to pay a lot of attention to. That is definitely a service industry. Uh, and living on, working on Bay Street, uh, puts you in the service industry. Retail and hospitality, do people really know how to serve? Retailing is such a really interesting um, field. Uh, my background, my father was a retailer. And uh, actually my son, uh, I had four sons. My youngest son is currently working at Canadian Tire. Um, a co-op term, and I told him, you know, if you really want to learn how business works, go work for a retailer. I think Canadian Tire is a great place. I mean, learning all these things about promotions and, you know, getting movie product around for stuff, it's a service system. Healthcare. Does anyone really understand how healthcare works? Drop down to grade eight. Uh, if the kids visit the doctor, you know, who pays for that? Uh, why is emergency services separate from um, inpatient, different things? Uh, by grade nine, education. And so they've now been in school for nine years. The question is, do you know why you're there? Um, and so let's talk about how education is the work. The last three systems, grade nine and 10, systems that govern, because government is actually the most complicated system. And so it's easier to talk about cities because you can go to city hall and see how it works. When you go to the province, do you really understand, like, the impact that when they do something. So if you go to Queen's Park, well you actually understand what's going on and how that impacts your life. It's actually pretty abstract. 
And when you get to the federal level, it's like super abstract. So now I'm going to ask, by show of hands, how many people are going to be working in the service industry when they graduate? Okay. You're like one of those uh, fish in water, right? You kind of didn't know you're already in the service system. And so we need to pay attention to this because a lot of the way that people talk about systems is mechanical, industrial. <coughs> one word I'm going to alert you of, and you, you'll, you'll think about this every time you hear it. Some will say, we need a mechanism to fix that. Mechanism is a machine. Should we actually say, we need an organism to fix that? It's not a little strange at first, but you know, it's like, you can't do, are we going to fix this machine? Are we going to fix this like a human being or a horse or something else? You know, what type of system are we going to work on? So there was a definition. Um, this is uh, Institute for Manufacturing in um, uh, University of Cambridge. And they created this definition that what a service system is, this actually said the same thing as that, I'm trying to break it down for you. A service system is a dynamic configuration of resources. The resources are people, technology, organizations that share information. Service systems create and deliver value. The value is done through service. The value is between a provider and a customer. A service system can be a complex system. The complex system has interactions, and the interactions are the interface between provider, customer, 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 supplier, supplier. Okay, so what's the difference between a production system and a service system? I had an assignment in IBM 1999. There's a book that I get a footnote in uh, called Adaptive Enterprise. Steve Hackle had this idea of, of taxis versus buses. Okay, so what happens? What's the difference between one and the other? So a bus is a production system. A bus runs on a schedule. It doesn't matter whether people are there or not. The bus depends on the schedule. You get into a taxi, what happens with the taxi? The first question the taxi, asks, the taxi driver asks is, where do you want to go? A service system can't operate without a customer. A production system operates fine without a customer. If we get into like China and you know five-year plan, ten-year plans, the old industrial way of doing it, the reason they had imbalances was that the factories were put in place and their job was to produce, and they produced. But they didn't produce stuff that people needed or wanted, so you end up with all these huge oversupplies of things. A service system has customers. <coughs> Now, taxi cabs and buses, okay? Why do you want buses? Why don't we just run everything as taxi cabs? Traffic flow. Hmm? Traffic flow. Traffic flow. Efficiency. Uh, emissions. Expense. Yeah, so it's, it's because of volume. Because uh, old Red Rust Lakoff story, so he was doing consulting work um, in London, and you know the double-decker buses, and they have they have people, uh, they have the ticket takers. This is old style. He got the old in the sixties. They have this idea of uh, so people come and they give the, the ticket to the person on the bus so they get on the bus, right? And and in London it was causing congestion because all of the people were lining up, and the bus would get delayed because some people trying to get on the bus. What's the solution to this? Well, you put the ticket takers, took the ticket takers off the bus and put them at the stop. You check all the people at the stop, and then they just get all the bus. That's one way of solving a problem. It doesn't resolve the problem, but it, it's one way of solving the problem. So you can make things better. When you are at rush hour, buses work much better than point-to-point -point transportation. If you are not in rush hour, however, Maybe you want to be service oriented as opposed to production oriented. So there was a point at which, at the end of the GO train line, that was Oshawa and the East End, um, they, they, would, they didn't offer the last stop. They would stop one stop short of the terminus 
And what they would do is provide taxi service to everyone that came off the GO train. Because it was cheaper for them to run taxis off the end of the GO train line than it was to actually run the train to the end of the line. That's a mixture of production system and a service system. And you can do these for other things with economics and the work these things out. Okay. Thinking about service systems, uh, one of the problems working in service science is that definitions of services get to be really a problem. Um, so those of you that can do your research that will find this this phrase that's become pretty common called service dominant logic, which is opposed to a goods dominant logic. Um, and uh, I, I met Steve Margo um, actually in Tokyo, and I had this discussion. I said, well, there's two ways of discussing services. One is to use the term services, and people get comfortable with it, and you think you know what it means, but you actually don't. And then you kind of go, like, I'm explaining what service is, what service is. The other is to create a new word and vocabulary that people don't understand. And it's really clear that people don't understand. So I went this way. Uh, this is work by Rafael Ramirez, who was a graduate of ACOF's program at Eastern University of Pennsylvania a long time ago. Um, they created this idea of what he called an offering. An offering is a combination of physical content, service content, and people content. Okay? So, we have this idea of offering, and we can separate out these sorts of, of things. Um, a service is something, so a product, yeah. a physical product, you understand, you get the physical product. So we talk about uh, iTunes. So you have to get an iPhone, an iPod, or whatever. You have the service, which is the ongoing connection, software update, and stuff like that, it's all mechanized. And if you actually break the thing, you go into the app store and you get a human being in the So there's the three parts. But there's different ways of handling this offering. Uh, the traditional industrial logic we've had has been offering as output and customer value through the transaction. So this is buying a car as an example. Okay, so we have a car, you buy the car, they, they, they have this output, this production system that creates an automobile, you get that, it is the auto manufacturer's output. And when I buy the car, I own it. It's a transaction, right? I can't go back, I can do a recall, like for a first year there's a, a warranty or whatever, and, you know, more power train and sort of stuff, but I own it, right? And so do they really care about that? Um, you can move a little bit this way and say that the customer value is the relationship. And so you, you still have the auto manufacturer and they have an output, but we can work on a service logic customer satisfaction or lease a car. If you lease a car, you have the output, but it's a service, an offering more service oriented. It's over a period of time. It's not just a transaction at a single point in time, right? It's something that's ongoing a long time. Now you can always all have this idea as an input. And an input is self-service logic. An ATM, banking machine, is self-service logic. They used to provide the services and the products on a bank, industrial logic, and now it's like, well, actually you can do that yourself. Okay? So why is this an input as opposed to an output? Well, you know, if you make a mistake when you're online, it's your mistake, right? If you're doing it the other way, in industrial logic, if the bank made a mistake, it's like different. So now you are becoming part of the system, and therefore their offering is part of your income. If you're trying to get beyond transactions into partnership logic, which is a bit through relationship, you're now looking at a long-term relationship. Uh, I used to work a lot with people at IBM Research, and we always get this thing, you know, from customers, and uh, say, oh, we want the smartest people, you know, and I said, well, I'm going to research, and they say, oh, well, you know, we'd like to get people. And I said, okay, but this is not consulting. What's there between research and consulting at IBM? Because they're actually two completely separate parts of the company. And I worked in consulting, but I actually worked a lot with people in research, but I had access to them. And I said, okay, here's, here's the rule. Uh, firstly, if I do consulting work for you, you will get a deliverable at the end. I can actually describe to you what the engagement's going to be about. 
And I guarantee you deliverable. I don't guarantee what the, you know, what actually know what the answer is going to be, but there will be a report at the end that has a sort of structure for them. If we do research, it is collaborative. I will bring research people as an input. I will not guarantee any output because it's collaboration. It could be that we bring all the right people. And here's the thing that I want, and here's, here's the interesting part that we have uh, now. I understand PhDs are not very common um, in business. So for every PhD I bring on site, I want at least two masters, people at the master's level or above on your side. Because they work together and they'll collaborate, but it's not consulting work. You can't have these PhDs there to teach people. That's not their function. The purpose of research. So that's a partnership logic with offering as an input. So as you're thinking through what you're proposing to do, you can think about whether you are just saying, give the output, we can do something, or it's an input, and we'll have to do something together to add to it. That's a shift toward thinking about services. Okay, how are we doing? Doing really well. Not for next one. Okay. So, um, I'm going to introduce this idea of affordance and the pattern language. This is pretty new stuff. So, uh, first thing, how many people know what an affordance is? Okay. They have two design students, so we think of what affordances are. Uh, how many people know what pattern language is? Okay. Or what? Okay. So there is a series of books um, that came out in between 1985 and 1979 of Christopher Alexander. Um, a pattern language, um, towns, building constructions. And what, you, what the idea was was to create a language that describes how buildings are created. There's a timeless way of building. So, so the, the pattern language is the um, catalog of uh, descriptions. The timeless way building is a process oriented thing. How is it you actually build buildings? And the Oregon experiment was the design of the University of Oregon campus that applied these three. So these three came out. Uh, they're very well known in the architecture community. Uh, for those of you who uh, actually like this idea pattern language, my suggestion is you can go to the library and and the a pattern language is almost in every single library in the world. So certainly it's in the OCAD library. It's in the Federal Public Library. It's like really easy. It's like this thick. And it's really good and it's good to browse at. Um, but if you really want to know what's going on, you should read the new book, which is called Battle for the Life and Beauty of the Earth, which is a really gutsy title. Um, and what this book is about is uh, Christopher Alexander was a builder an architect professor at Berkeley, and he created the Center for Environmental Structure. Um, and and he, he and his team um, wrote these three books. And so um, uh, I got to meet, this, this, these are the people in the uh, pattern language in the Pearl Conference community that I had met in, um, uh, in October. That's not what I was at. But the uh, newest book is a description of creating a new what was supposed to be a high school college building in Japan uh, in around 1985. Uh, and so he's struggling with the system of construction. There's a way of doing constructing the whole industry around construction in Japan. And what he's working on is how do you do that differently? So sort of things that you read in the book are uh, about how is it that we use like redwood in Japan. You have to export the redwood from California to get over to Japan. And how do you technologically? Well, you're going to run that through the full like, production system. Like, importing redwood is pretty expensive. Well, you could cut it out and you could just go direct because you're buying directly from people in California. But of course, then there's this chapter about the Yakuza and the Mafia in So, uh, Chris Brown Alexander is really well known. Um, look on Wikipedia if you haven't seen it. But what is a pattern? A pattern is a recurring structural configuration that solves a problem in a context, contributing to the wholeness of some whole or system that reflects some aesthetic or cultural value. So, hmm. a lot of interesting words there. So, this idea of pattern language, we have pattern name, just 
label this whole thing. We have a problem. We have a context around the problem. You have the resulting context, which is after you've built something, you've changed it. We have the forces, which are contradictory considerations that you take into account when solving a, choosing a solution to a problem. So when you actually solve a problem, you are making choices in the system. Um, we're going to spend more on the structure and less on the finishing. So the, you know, this economic sort of thing. So do you want to spend more on the outside of the house, spend more on the structure, spend more on the plumbing, do you want more floors? These sort of things, all trade-offs. There are forces, and some of them are physical, that you know, a, a building can only support so much. You're gonna, if, you, if you're building a three-story building, you're going to put in stronger foundations, these sort of things. Some of them are economic, because you have to decide one way or the other. Uh, and you have the solution, which is actually the thing that you're trying to do. But the, the idea that you start off with this and kind of move toward this resulting context is change of context. Now, this is architecting. Remember, I was talking about architecture as being outside the system. So you have Christopher Alexander, who is an architect, not a designer, although you know all architects are designers. But he's focused on the outside. He's not really so focused on the inside of what's happening. He has to do both, but it, it's slightly different. Uh, within the pattern language, is generally a rationale. Why is this solution than the other solution? And then the related patterns. And the related patterns are when you connect one pattern to another, because things go together. Affordances. Now, Peter had sent me a, a, a note because he asked if I knew what Don, Don Norman's work on affordances. And those of you who read Don Norman's work on affordances, it's not exactly what we mean. There's a, Don got himself into a little bit of a uh, tickle because, so, so Don, uh, was at Apple, and people generally talk about affordances when they design computer interfaces. So the usual one is the trash can on a Mac interface, right? So people think that you design these things on computer systems, and they are the affordance. Let's go back to the original description of what an affordance is. This comes from J.J. Gibson, okay? And the usual example people talk about is a doorknob. Why do you have a doorknob on a door? A doorknob affords you the ability to pull on the door. Okay. So when you are looking at designing things, should you be thinking about doing affordances? Now, this, this, this is where I've been looking at this over a long period of time, because you end up with these questions about is it a feature, is it a function, these sort of things, and I think as designers and as architects, we should be thinking about affordances. So do you want a doorknob on a doorknob? Well, it's a swinging door. Why would you, if you put a doorknob on a swinging door, people are going to get confused. But no, so, okay. So, yes, yeah, so I did a doorknob. And so then the question is, well, is this like, is the doorknob the affordance? If you go back to J.J. Gibson, the doorknob is not the affordance. If you have a doorknob, it actually requires that people understand what the doorknob is. So the first time you come to a doorknob, it's like, what is it? Again, like to teach a child to pull on the door. Like that's what it's for. My sons went to school in China. Um, they, they, they graduated from high school and went to university in, in China. And uh, I have a friend that uh, also um, went way back. He talked about how in China, when you get to the university system, there isn't a correlation between intelligence and, in effect, cultural knowledge. And so you would get people coming to universities, and in rural China, they use squat toilets. What do you do when you come into a washroom and it's like the squat toilet isn't there, you have a Western toilet? What do you do with it? You stand on top of it, like, okay, so now, okay, so a toilet isn't a, a, stand, a Western toilet is an affordance, but it's not an affordance because it doesn't afford the capabilities of the person, but they don't understand what it is. So an affordance is not the thing. The affordance is the interaction between something and the thing. And the something is generally an 
and this is when you get an anthropology and psychology, it is an animal. It doesn't even have to be a human being, because chimpanzees will actually use a twig, or a twig you know, they use it with a shovel sort of stuff. So they'll figure these things out. But an affordance is an interaction. So there's, there's two things that have to happen. One will have to be the physical thing there, but then the other one is that people have to recognize. So let's talk about service systems. We can have a service system, and we have two beneficiaries. One is high ability, and one is low ability. Okay? So <coughs> when we talk about high ability, we'll talk about someone who is high school age up to, you know, before retirement. Talk about low ability, we talk about kids, you know, kindergarten and below, and retirees above, and I'm approaching the retirees above. Anyway. So there are people with that are buildings. So when you are designing a service, how do you design that service? If we design it for people with low ability, you're going to need output, service as an output, right? So why do banks still have branches? Why is it that people have to go to a branch? I mean, what if there's all the old people are so used to going to branches? Well, but if you are low ability, sometimes face-to-face -face communication is the best way to get things done. So it's interesting, we get into discussions, we take a high ability person into a low ability situation. And the most interesting one was, uh, I went into my local branch. I'll leave the bank on the name at this point. But I got into an argument with the clerk because I heard this is the third time. I sent my wife to the bank to send a wire transfer, and my wife comes home and said they don't have enough information. We've done this a lot, like, you know, I had to send some money to Finland at the university actually overpaid me and paid it back. So I had to send them, and, they, and so I've done this before. And uh, got sent back. And my wife goes, I give her more information. My wife goes to the bank, comes back, and says, then the bank says that there's not enough information. So I go into the bank, and I'm arguing with the bank person, telling them there is enough information in the, in the, in the form. And she makes me sign this thing that says, we are sending this wire transfer, if the money comes back, it's your fault. She you can't do this. It's like, no, this is not the, this is not, the, like, I actually know what I'm doing. You know, like I've been in Finland for like, you know, over 10 years, and I'm going back and forth. I know how to wire money, and so, Anyway, this is my, my. So, but both people don't know how to do wire transfer. They come in and you have the form, it's like, make sure all these fields are filled out, right? So I actually have a personal banker on the phone, so I can actually call in. Sometimes I have to step a person. Anyway, so the term of forms refers to whatever it is about the environment that contributes to the kind of interaction that occurs. So yeah, you've got the doorknob, but you have to have the person recognize the doorknob at the same time. Um, and there's a lot of stuff about that I'll leave for now. Um, so this brings me to um, this paper, which is um, the October paper, which if you really want to understand the stuff like inside out, what I've done is Christopher Alexander designed, the pattern language that he designed was for buildings and construction. And it has been applied and cross-appropriated into software development. So there's a book called Design Patterns, which is written by one of the people, John Lassigis, who I did research, so called Game of Four. Um, and they took this idea and they took it to software development. And, and they're doing the building analogies and saying, well, software is like buildings. So since I grew through this generation, it's nice thing about being old and getting through all this sort of thing, is can we use pattern language on services? Because I think I find about service services is they're so abstract. Like we been talking a lot of examples of buses, taxis, and things like that. But when you talk about a service, how is it you should be talking about it? And the way that Christopher Alexander talks about this is problems and solutions. Now, problems and solutions sounds really good, but it's kind of on the abstract side. So you know, what is a real problem? What do you mean by a solution? Like, and if you're if you've been reading some of the Garrett Garrett Doggy stuff, and you start getting into solving, dissolving, resolving problems, take off. Like, problem is a problem term. So I've taken this shift and say, if we're going to design service systems, why don't we think about affordances instead? 
And that's what this paper is about. If you, this paper goes from Alexander. It took me three years. I, I, I was at the Pattern Language and the Plot Conference. Pattern Language and Program, which is the computer science community. I was at the uh, Purple Sock Conference, which is social change community, and then an Arctic community. It's taking a lot of to get my head around it. Um, but we're going to actually try some of this stuff um, in a few minutes. Um, okay, so why is it called a pattern language, and why do you want to use pattern language? So this is the original book, um, 1968, um, and it's about designing a multi-service center. So 1968, Alexander is starting up the Center for Environmental Structure in Berkeley. Um, and I've had such a pattern language. I haven't written it yet, these books that are coming out. But it's like, OK, how do we actually describe to people what it is to be in a better building, a better home, a better, um, in this case, uh, what he was looking at was multi-service centers. In 1968, it's a new idea that you take government services and put them all in one building. So in, like, medical and you know, all sorts of stuff. And, and, and as a matter of fact, these multi-service centers, when they're designed, were in really hard areas like the Bronx. Okay? So you, what happens? You have people on drugs. You have alcoholics. And when they come in, you can't just say, OK, if it's physical, we send them to a hospital. If it's mental, we send them to a psychologist or somewhere else. And by the way, they've lost their driver's license ID. You might send somewhere else. No, let's bring everything into one place. So he created all these patterns, um, and then the patterns are connected to each other. Uh, he had this idea that at the top you have, now you get into the shearing layers, the pacing layers sort of idea. There are some things that change more slowly than others. Right? So in the, in the top you have the slowest changing stuff, and of course the bottom you have the faster changing stuff. And why do you do this? There are unique features of each special building. So when you're designing a pattern language, you don't want to say that this is the pattern that works forever. Patterns are in context. So under these conditions, it becomes important. So for this multi-service center, it makes a big difference whether the multi-service center is in an urban or suburban location. If you're in an urban center, people have to be able to walk to it. Parking is not very pretty tough, and you have to provide parking. If you're in a suburban location, you have to provide so people can drive in. But then this thing was actually designed mostly for people that um, are really tough. Uh, uh, they're hard on their luck. So they you end up having your bus lines or whatever. So where do you want to put a multi-service center? Well, I may want to put it beside a junction or a big uh, uh, transit hub on the track. It tells patterns which to consider first and which to consider later. You start off with the biggest ones, the slowest ones, as I said, before doing the details. And then there are patterns that go together. When you create the pattern catalog, and when you look at Christopher Alexander's book, Pattern Language, which has 253 patterns, you don't use 253 patterns all the time. You say, well, this is what's important. So a pattern in Christopher Alexander's, uh, Christopher Alexander's book is an example is light on two sides. So it's this pattern, which is when you design a building, it's nice to have light on two sides. Because if you have light on one side, you know, kind of it's not bad, but it's better to get light on two sides, right? This feels nicer. That's a pattern. So if you have light on two sides, what's that do to the rest of the building? You only have so many quarters. So you end up with these sort of uh, forces that go back and forth. Okay, so I'm not going to show you the original. I mean, I'm going to go to the next slide immediately. Um, this is in the paper that I wrote, um, and. The way I frame this is let's actually change the way. So, so originally, the pattern language was solution to a problem in context, right? I'm not, I don't like that. So let's do it this way. Let's do, we have the pattern label. We have voices on issues, who and what. Now, this is the primary thing I think we should be thinking about is when you're doing services, who is that service for and what is it all about? You know, what, what is it you're providing as a service? Okay. Secondly, the affording values. The va when I say affording, there's a f you can afford uh, the feature, the doorknob, right? Or the value, which is the door open. Okay. Spatio-temporal frames, when and where. So the when and where gets down to not recognizing. If you provide a feature in a pattern, are people actually going to know that it's there? There's a containing system, slower, larger. You people have read about panarchy, right? You're hauling. Have you read the paper yet? Okay. 
Um, I'll come back to this, but there is a slower system above and there's a faster system below, right? So the containing system is slower and larger, the containing system is smaller and faster. Okay, so pattern label. We're talking about this multi-service center. When you have this multi-service center, people will come, you have, uh, you have a uh, underage, unwed mother with an alcohol problem coming in. She has a kid. One of the things you need to provide, or a good idea, is minding children. Someone has to look after the kids. Okay. Voice on the issues. For a client, what services are available now and on appointment? Okay. Uh, what do I do with the kids when I'm busy? For a child, what could I parents do when there's multi in the multi-service center? So there's an idea that there are different voices here that have different needs. And let's start off with understanding those. Secondly, affording values. So what is it that happens? So affording value is leaving a child in a supervised play area so the whereabouts are known. The mother doesn't have to worry. Can you provide a service, a feature of a service, so the mother doesn't have to worry? Uh, a value distraction for toddlers to teens so the coming of parents is less mature. You don't, you don't want a person not coming in for services because it's inconvenient because no one will look after the kids. You want them to come in. <coughs> Spatial temporal frame. So when do you want minding kids? Facilities and programs are known both to children and parents in advance of appointments. If you actually had to schedule child minding specific times, like mornings and not afternoons because you're short of resources, everyone needs to know that. So you're going to get the mothers that are not going to come in the afternoon to go, oh, I'll come tomorrow morning. Containing systems, slower and larger. So minding children. What is a larger system of taking care of kids? Extended family schools and community workers. Okay, so you have private services to, to, uh, that might inhibit service engagement. I actually pose these ones as questions because you end up with a, a system where, it, and the containing system where you're actually thinking about how the pattern impacts the larger system. And the containing system is going well faster. You have all the other kids there. And can I ask you to look after this is an informal thing? So yes, there's a place to look after kids. Okay. So here's the interactive part. We have no, we don't have time. Sorry. <laughs> I was going to do one of these. When I have time, I actually um, and I did this in Finland. I blogged it. I actually go through and have people think about these things and work through an example with you. But I don't have time today, so sorry. Um, I thought I was going to run have more time. But the, here's the idea about it, and this is a systemic approach. So Peter hasn't actually seen it or done this before, and Jeremy hasn't seen it before, he well as well as But this is trying to take service systems and system thinking together. Okay, and here's the, here's the clues on how you do it. Pattern language, interaction, phrase, and present participle, no, on, on this, all this format stuff. So if you're interested, you can talk to me afterward, you can email me, or we can schedule something. But if you want to do pattern language, it's an interesting way to go. Okay. Fourth thing, and we're going to run out of time before we get to the fifth, I think, is I want to talk about this idea of interaction now. Because I've got you moving towards affordances, and designers actually should know what affordances are. Um, but this idea of, uh, of what's the underlying philosophy behind that and how to change the way you look at the world. So, the only naming definition you get on systems. System thinking is perspective, though so not everyone used to share that perspective. It's on whole parts and their relations. So this is one that actually John Sheed helped me with um, when I first started up when I was learning systems. I started in 1998. Um, because well, you have these ideas. What is function? Stru you know, there are three basic ideas. Function, structure, and process. People use that. Okay, so function is contribution to a part to the whole. So you have a function, which is a non-living thing, or you have a role, if it's a living thing. So generally, when we talk about human beings, we talk about their role in an organization. You could call them function, but actually it's more correct to say they have this role in an organization. The department, which is a group of people, has a function. Uh, people have roles. And you always talk about the containing whole. So here, here's the usual example I talk about. Uh, when, if we talk about problems we have with the TTC, when you have problems with the TTC, you get on the streetcar, don't be mad at the streetcar driver. The streetcar driver is doing what he's supposed to be doing. The problem is the containing hole. The problem is funding. 
The, the central problem with TTC in Toronto has nothing to do with the city. It has to do with the funding from the province. That is containing coal. That is one containing coal. There are multiple containing holes of happen. But you're not starting off from the system and you're looking outwards. The Russ Acoff, when you start looking at his stuff, it's all about function. Function generally means ends, which is philosophy to theology. Um, and this is a way of thinking about system. What is the purpose of the system? Acoff's PhD dissertation was called, it got rewritten, it's called On Purposeful Systems. There's a purpose associated with the system. You then have structure, which is arrangement in space. You have two parts and how they interact with each other. And you have process, which is arrangement in time. Okay. Skill testing question. Which comes first, structure or process? And it took me like eight years in the system community before someone said, oh, that's obvious, isn't it? Which comes first, structure or process? Hmm? No one said, wait, tough question. <laughs> the answer is process comes first. Why does process become first? It's because of a matter of perspective. When you look at a mountain, people think that a mountain is part of structure because it doesn't change very quickly. But a mountain changes too. When something slows down so much that it seems to not move, we call that structure. But everything moves. Everything changes, right? This gets into the deep philosophy in our Aristotle and Start flying this and that sort of stuff. The question is, what is real? Are, are things real that there, there are two ways of looking at what's real? One is, what is real is things that don't change. The other way of looking at it is, what is real is only those things that change. It's two different branches of philosophy we're looking at. Authentic system thinking, I was talking about when I talk about system thinkers, and sometimes they don't seem like they're real system thinkers. Authentic system thinkers, synthesis precedes analysis and the containing whole appreciated. Now this is straight out of Acoff, okay? Synthesis is putting things together. Analysis is taking things apart. Russ Acoff says that what you do when you're doing system thinking Identify a whole containing system of which the thing to be explained is a part. I said the TTC was the system, the containing system was the pr province. If you want to understand the TTC, firstly look at the province. Explain the behavior of properties of the containing whole. Okay, so what's happening in the province? What's the, pro what's the province have to say about um, Scarborough Subway? You're saying they don't care? Should they care? Explain the behavior property of the thing to be explained in terms of the role or function within the containing whole. So, you know, if, if the province would just give more funding or more direction, it could solve the problems of the TDC. But now you're getting into authentic system thinking. Are you putting things together? You're taking things apart. Because that requires that the province and the city, TDC, all work together, which is putting things together, synthesis. What people want to do, because we have limits of lives, is you take things apart and say, I'm only working on this, because I can't manage the whole thing. And that's why system thinking is an art. It's because you have to manage that balance between synthesis and analysis. You put it together, you take things apart. Now fundamentally, you're in a design program. Design should be more <coughs> about synthesis. Design should be about bringing things together Engineering could be doing taking them apart. But design should be more about putting things together. Okay. Panarchy theory, I don't know, we don't have time to cover this, but you post another reading. But what I'm going to focus on is this part that people forget. And if you if, if you don't know this, then you need to go back and reread just this section of the of, of, uh, of panarchy. People focus too much on this loop. Okay? What you need to focus on is actually the connections between smaller and faster and larger and slower systems. 
So we talked about the how buildings learn. Okay? That's a connection over time. We start here, we talk about TTC in the system. What would happen if you want a faster system? A smaller and faster system? This is a taxi system, this is a TTC. What would happen if we didn't have the TTC? What would be the system that would work in the city of Toronto? It had to be trains. We could actually use Go Transit as our urban transportation system if the TTC just went away. Because there is a train, like it's a little bit far from here from uh, Union Station to Maine, but it's better than walking, right? You could use that. So there's this connection between systems and they all happen in time. Now, here's a switch. This is a, this is a slide I added last night because it has this really interesting statement on system, and it has to do with system thinking. Ask not what's inside your head, but what your head's inside of. This is a fundamental shift that came with J.J. Gibson when he talked about environment, ecological psychology. So when people talk about ecological, you, you, you use that word, ecology, ecological, what does it really mean? Ecological is the interaction between the system and the environment, the outside. We are not looking inside the system, we are looking at how it interacts with the bigger world. So I really like this idea about, ask not what's inside your head. Psychology tends to focus on what's inside your head. But let's say, let's, where, what's your head inside of? Look at the world outside. And so the world that James Gibson was looking at originally, stimulus response, behavioral psychology, is all about understanding. It's a Pavlov's dog here, right? You ring the bell, you give the food, the dog actually you know, will start salivating. You ring the bell, you don't even give them the food, they'll start salivating. This is given as a response. So that's the basis, one of the basics of, of, of behavioral psychology. Ecological approach to perception that, that was brought in by J.J. Gibson. He was interested in how planes land. Now, this was like World War uh, at the end of the uh, 1940s, 1950s. So, can you explain landing an airplane through stimulus response? It's like, whoa. So figure it out. Okay, so they see the landing script and then they adjust and okay, now we have higher levels of stimulus and higher levels of responses. And that's the model that it breaks down. So what he's done is said, okay, let's look at this differently. Let's look at ecological approach and it's created a whole new branch. And this is, I'm working on the last chapter of my dissertation. It's, uh, I've been working on this thing, you know, the 2006, I've been actively writing this thing. And I made my whole shift. Uh, now, if you are in the systems community, there is Russell Acoff, who is a big name. One of the other big names is Gregory Bateson. Gregory Bateson, um, his, his footnote would be that, that if people are into anthropology, he was married to Margaret Mead. Um, and Margaret Mead is a little better known than, than Bateson. But Bateson was an anthropologist as well. And after he died, um, he, he published stuff and, and started talking about the ecological approach. And so now we're not looking, it is a systemic approach, it's not one that's very, it's, it's popular, it's, the systems community is very large, and there are different camps and schools. And so what's happened is that in the last two years or three years, I moved from being an ACOF person, I was never a very strong ACOF person, to being a stronger Bateson person. And the reason I've done that is coming through the work of Tim Ingold, who is a really, really great read. Um, He's an anthropologist. I went in December, I rewrote my whole European trip so I got to go to Pondicherry speaking, got to meet the guy, old or tired. Um, but uh, Tim Ingold has taken the work of Bateson and Gibson and put them together. So what does this mean to you? If you're working, if you're thinking about the world, stop thinking about the doorknob. Think about the interaction between the person and the doorknob. That is a system as well. It's a different system, and I'll tell you that you guys are the first that I've actually given this lecture to. So you're are now on the edge of the systems community, edge of systems thinking. When someone says, you, when I say, I, I moved from Acoff to Bates, and people go, wow, we moved. People know. Most people don't understand that. But now you understand what I'm getting to. When you look at Acoff, you're talking more about the doorknobs. Now, doorknobs exist, and they're important. 
But there's not one way to look at a system. Another way of looking at a system is the interaction between me and the doorknob and anyone else that walks up to that door. And if you're doing a service system, not designing buildings, it means something different. So, straight out to in gold. Okay, it draws this uh, kind of circle, I think. How is it you have to read that? What's, what's that mean to a person? And you're in a system class, right? So, most people draw the circle and think, oh, that must be like, you have the system on the inside and you've got the environment on the outside. Well, actually, he doesn't mean that at all. He means follow the line. It's a line. And so what he says is, in this depiction, there's no inside or outside, there's no boundary separating the two domains, rather a trail of movement or growth. A trail of movement and growth. We're now into anthropology, to have when you're in system to get all over the place. Um, and I'm reading, I've been reading this stuff two, three years now. What, what is the anthropology about? Anthropology essentially is how do human beings, human beings differ from animals? That's what it's about. How do we differ from chimpanzees, all these other otter, eating whatever animal? But most of what happens from J.J. Um, Gibson's work and ecological perception stuff, it all applies to animals as well. The movement's important. And so we have this idea of a line. Okay? So what does it mean to recognize a living system? A living system. Is the best way to represent a living system as being? And you draw the circle and you have a system on the inside and you have this stuff the environment on the outside? Okay, you draw the circle, you have this environment on the outside. How do you represent time? We, we discussed structure and process, right? Arrangement in space, arrangement in time. And if we actually decide that process comes before structure, it's like, okay, we need to rethink the way we're thinking systems. So we draw this line, um, and we can draw it different ways. So um, how do we interpret the line? There's a one way of doing it, static perimeter, second way is movement. Now here's the interesting thing about looking at uh, Tim Ingold's work. Um, what he studied was, uh, after he graduated, he got a uh, fellowship and ended up in Finland studying the Sami people. So he studies the people way up in the north of Finland. Um, it's pretty interesting in Finland when I go to Finland talking about the Sami people, and they go, I say, is that part of Finland? They go, no one really cares when you're up that far north, right? It's like Sweden, Finland, it's kind of Norway, it's kind of all around there, no one really cares. Because these people are up there, it's there. Um, but it also parallels a lot of the research that's being done with the Inuit. So if you look on YouTube and start listening to Tim Ingold lectures, he does a lot of them on YouTube. Um, he's actually been at UBC quite a lot because um, he studies um, anthropology, the center of anthropology at, uh, at UBC is quite big. So um, it's interesting listening to him because what he does is he actually gives talks, no visual slides, he just talks and then he writes up the talks and publishes them. So it's really great to listen to and you kind of get the idea if you are not the logical kind of guy, like I'm, I'm a super logical guy and so I find this stuff kind of hard to follow. I listen to the lectures and I get the idea over time. Um, but one of the things that he talks about is in the Inuit language and culture, what's the difference between a point and a line? A point is something that is a standing still. A line is something that moves. If it moves, it's alive. If it's a point, it's dead. Now, here's a really fine point of systems thinking. When you're doing system thinking, um, people like to think about systems, and you talk about the economists, they like to say equilibrium. Equilibrium supply is demand this sort of stuff. Okay. When you're at equilibrium for a systems person, what does equilibrium mean? The only state of equilibrium for living human beings is death. There's nothing happening. You are now part of the structure. There is no movement. You are dead. So for the Inuit, you are only alive if you move. Okay? So when we draw this line, he thinks about the pathway. So if we think about now movement and pathways, we get down to how do we live lives and how we represent the world. We often think about this as 
lines in the, a network, and we draw these dots. Now, now we get to the heart of what it's talking about, the title of this talk, representation. Be careful what you're drawing. There are these dots, and you have people connected in a network. Are these people dead? <laughs> OK, so why are you drawing people as dots and connected between them? Why don't we do instead look at lines that intersect? Each of us are in a line. We have our own lines. We come to intersect, and we have these knots. And we create these knots, um, and then we move away. Right? The knot may be there. It's actually hard to undo the human relationship. So I come here now. I form a knot with you today. Your mind has changed a little bit, and you, you know I'll still be around. And my line's going in a different direction, but you'll always be part of this knot that we're together. And this is the idea of mesh work that Tim Ingle has. Part of what I like in Tim Ingle's work, one of the things that's really been revolutionary for me in thinking about learning. So we talk about learning, how buildings learn, right? So he talks about the maze and the labyrinth. There's a distinction between a maze and a labyrinth. Uh, a maze has not just one path, it has multiple choices, and you go into a maze and it's a dead end. Okay, there's usually there's, there's multiple ways in, multiple ways out with dead ends in it. A labyrinth is universal. There is one way into a labyrinth. There is one way out of a labyrinth. There, for those of you looking for a labyrinth, um, at, uh, beside the church for the Holy Trinity on Bay Street, um, around the Eaton Center, they believe it's in around the church for the Holy Trinity, there's a labyrinth there on the ground. So you can go play around with a labyrinth that kind of over in those square walk on streets and whatnot. But there's the idea of a labyrinth, which is one way in, one way out. So what's the point of a labyrinth? Like, it's not a puzzle. There's no dead ends. You go one way in, one way out. It's like, OK. The, the challenge is you get into a labyrinth is that you end up, you know, if you're talking about Hades and the Underworld, the stories of Ravi. So um, those of you who uh, get into the movie Inception, movie Inception, uh, the principal, the, uh, the role of the woman, the lead woman on this, is actually named after the person that goes into the labyrinth. It's one way in, one way out. Um, the, the problem with the labyrinth is getting into the labyrinth and then not exiting. Not because you can't exit, like you can just follow the path, it's only one way out, so it's not a big deal, but it's not about that, it's about paying attention. So fundamentally, there's a difference that Ingold brings, and he brings it in this idea about when we talk about learning, there's two ways of thinking about learning. One of the ways of learning is transmission of representations. So I have this idea, and what I have to do is take this knowledge and transplant it into your brain. That's like a computer way of doing it, right? Thinking about we have this knowledge. Do the other way of doing it is educating attention. So why am I here? You can, you know, what I said in systems thinking, you've read. And so, you know, I think I told you to read the books. But that's not really what learning is about. What I'm doing here is I'm educating your attention. I talk about process and structure, time and space. Like that all of a sudden, oh, you paying attention to that. And so there's this different orientation that comes when you take this different view, which is a line rather than the system and the environment. Okay, we come down to the end. Uh, it is now 1016. Um, I, as I said, we get through the fourth section. I'm going to skip all the way to the end because I like this one idea. Um, people who are into uh, following politics today uh, will appreciate this. Um, I'm going to see Ian Mitroff um, next week. And, uh, Ian Mitroff, to me, um, is actually the greatest living system thinker today. Um, uh, he worked around ACOF, he didn't work with ACOF. They both studied under the guy uh, named West Church. And he's written 23 books. So I think probably pretty really good. Um, and he, he wrote this one book, and he quote, makes this quote, if they can have you asking the wrong questions, they don't have to worry about the answers. Yeah. Now, this is something you have to look out for when you're looking at science. There are 
usually two types of errors that people make. Um, and then no statistically, there's a third type that most people know, and then I add the last one. So it's statistics. How many people know what a type one effect two error is in statistics? Well, I forgot the line school, but it was statistics. Okay, <laughs> statistics. So what happens is that when you do statistics, you're saying there's a relationship in the data. And so my individual example is drug testing. Okay, so you're doing drug testing, and they say the drug works. Okay, what are the type of errors you can make? Number one, false positive. Okay, the drug, you say that the drug works, but actually it doesn't work. So the type one error. A type two error is false negative. Okay, you say the drug doesn't work, but it does work. And it happens statistics. It's just a sample, right? So you can make this type two error. Systems people know better, and they actually say there is a type three error, and I call this tricking ourselves. Um, some people call this uh, solving the wrong problem. Type 3 error is solving the wrong problem. And he calls it tricking ourselves because what you're trying to do is solve the wrong problem precisely. Type 3 error. Shouldn't have been working on in the first place. Like, why are you doing drug testing at all? This drug is like, there's a reason for not using this drug at all, so why are we testing this drug? But the fourth type that is really underlooked is a type 4 error. And the type 4 error is intentionally having people work on the wrong problems. And that's what's happening in our world today, is that we have a lot of type 4 behavior happening. Is we're getting misled. So when I talk about systems, I come at it from a system science perspective. There's an art associated with the science. But we do from a science perspective, science relies on things like facts and things like that. Um, and what we're doing is, is trying to find ways to approach it, represent it, and make it so people can understand it. Um, I hope that, um, you probably brain is pretty full now. Um, so I'm gonna stop now, um, I'm around. Um, if you wanna hear this, um, I'm gonna, the, I'll have the audio recording up in a couple of weeks. I'm coming back tomorrow if you're good in my good one, ready to play again. <laughs> uh, but thanks for your time. Yeah. Take a question, but what's the schedule now, Peter? Oh, well, we'd like to uh, uh, start soon after 10 30. So we'll to take, uh, take a couple of questions. Okay, take it up. Yeah, go okay. ahead. Just leave it without any discussion. Okay, um, so uh, <laughs> what I'm hearing you say, I think, is um, the emergent pattern language in systems is to not pay attention to the structure, but the relationships as categorized by. Voices of forwarding spatio temporal, temporal containing and contained systems. Is that right? Okay, so, so the, pattern, the pattern language that you're proposing is framed yeah, by the relationships. Yeah, so, so the, the, if you actually read the paper, it goes into that in more detail. And actually, um, what it does is it goes back to um, the original Christopher Alexander work and it, it takes his structure and says, okay, this is how you design the building. Let's think of how you design the services that go into those. And Christopher's books on my uh, beside my bed. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so I, I, I'm familiar with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Is this right though? Like what I'm saying is it the relationships. Yeah. Well, so so this is what you get for being at the leading edge. This is a proposal that's taken three years to write. Mm -hmm. um, but um, if you understand the philosophy and all things I'm going on, um, my proposal, my 10-year project from this point, uh, from three years ago, is to create a pattern language for service systems because we have the pattern language for things that don't move. We don't have the pattern language for things that move. Yeah. And, and, and do you think that the that, that anthropological study has an influence on that? Because that's it, all about the, the cultural relationships between the experience of the person, yeah. right? The, the first thing, the, what did you say? The, the process experience comes first. Uh, uh, okay, there's a little yeah, I know I'm jumping. Yeah, around. no, no, that, 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 now we're deep into philosophy. So okay, so you're going to be able to. You'll, right. you'll, 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 you'll be entertained by my dissertation. This trace is supposed to be um, like, you know, 100 to 150 pages. My dissertation is currently 200, like 250 pages with a 300 page appendix. Um, so um, the last chapter is now, it's like 40 pages, which is not good. But in order to get the stuff out, I've had to go across philosophies. And so that's, what I'm trying to say is, and, and the purpose of this talk was, 
for you to challenge yourself on the way that you're representing stuff. Because as you work on your projects, you're thinking about stuff, the question is, am I thinking about stuff that is static, is like structural, that doesn't change? Or am I thinking about stuff that changes? And it, and it could go either way. Like, I'm not saying that one is better than the other, but in the pattern language literature, it's well developed in the things that don't change. The pattern language for the stuff that doesn't change, that does change, is not developed. And if I had a whole program, I would do that. Yes? Um, I love what you were talking about at the very end of um, points and lines. Mm -hmm. and points being like stagnant or as living systems. In living systems, like thinking about it as death, that really helped me shape a lot of my thinking like, immediately. Mm -hmm. um, with the lines, though, how do you how do you think about directionality? How do you think about like length and influence within those lines? Like, uh, you now, now you're into deep Tim Ingold. So um, the reason I went to so Tim Ingold's first book, Perception of the Environment, was written in twenty in two thousand. He's got a book in twenty eleven called Being Alive. Uh, and then I followed all this stuff, but I'm actually citing in my dissertation. Journal of Royal Anthropology Association, March 2017, where he talked about human correspondence. And he talked about this in December when I, I said, you haven't written about this stuff. He goes, yeah, we're that close to the edge. What he talks about is, um, is a river, okay? Um, and what happens, you have a person swimming in the river, and you go into the river with them. Now, the person in the river is a line, and you are another line. So, the question is, do the banks of the river map? And they do because they're real and physical, right? But you have to go along with the person as you're, as you're moving along, or you're both around, right? Because the river's moving. So um, what I like about the, the stuff that this all goes back into J.J. Gibson's work is that when you're looking at affordances, they have the sense of what's real in the world, like the doorknob, and they have the interaction. Whereas I find that a lot of the stuff, when you come from sociology, it's like, it's all about constructionism, and they're like, where's the door coming to this? It's like, no, no, it's about the social structure. No, no, I want to know about the door. And you guys are design students. You have to be concerned about the physical world. So let me ask the question. So did I answer your question or didn't answer your question? Well, no, you didn't answer your question. Well, I think my question now is like, the determination of the flow, is the assumption that the, the determination is really in the flow of which where the river is going? So if the river is going in this direction, you happen to be within that, then you're a function of the river? Or is it that you actually have an influence on which direction the river is flowing? That's the question. That is the question. Yeah. And, and that's what you need to work out for yourself when you are doing, doing your research work. Because, and, and, and this comes down to now what is research and how do you progress on it? You've got to take a position. Um, and a position means something. When someone comes to that different position, it's okay. Uh, I'm focused on the doorknob. I'm a doorknob manufacturer. It's like, okay, that's fine. I focus on the interaction between them. You're building doorknobs. We need the doorknobs. We also need people that are going to recognize them. So it's a matter of perspective here. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Appreciate you being with us today and, uh, and have a talk. I know there's always more left on the table. Um, did you mention uh, the Systems Thinking Ontario uh, oh, uh, no. monthly session? No, you know, we, might. we have so we have a monthly uh, community of practice. David makes it when he when he can. Actually, uh, I guess in the latter stages of dissertation work, some things uh, like your your treasured Systems Thinking group have to go because, but it has a continuity to it. So. Uh, um, uh, David and I helped launch this uh, community maybe five, six, seven years ago. I do. You, do you remember the uh, you know the actual year we started? No, it's it's just been going on for a long time now. It, it started after you gave uh, a session of design and dialogue that I think some people attended and wanted to see more. And and so there's been an ongoing uh, community of practice that started with the uh, the Toronto Systems Thinking Community. Meets the third Wednesday of every month. Uh, really non-linear. This is the, pro the problem with system thinking is so non-linear. <laughs> but it does actually start on time. <laughs> it does actually have a pretty clear structure. It starts at six fifteen. It ends at about eight, and it continues. You can leave at eight, but usually the conversation then continues to a convivial dinner with about anywhere from six to a dozen people. So you have a chance to. Uh, 
uh, to continue the, uh, the discourse over a meal, and that sometimes goes up to 10 o'clock. Yeah. I won't be there for March, I may be there for April. Yeah. And so we often get, uh, you know, when there's a colleague that's in town that is going to be available on that third Wednesday, we usually you know, try to get them to, you know, to, to give us a special you know, brief talk and then a discussion around that talk. And if we're in a pinch for a session, well, in our, in our last uh, session, uh, I, uh, we did the echo policy simulation game, so we actually had a really good turnout for that. We were doing here. So yeah, usually we're over at Lambert Lounge in the main building, in uh, MHA room 187, the same room that we often do design and dialogue with, but this is kind of a spin-off of the design and dialogue we do, so, when, so good luck to you <laughs> in, 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 in the next couple of months, and we'll uh, probably, uh, and I'll see you tomorrow. So yeah. if you missed any of this, and you want to see more, David will be giving, not the, you're heraclitated, right? This will not be the same river, or I mean, that you'll be stepping into a different river, but yeah. it will be the same slides. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you never step into the same river twice. So, he'll be giving this talk tomorrow in the uh, uh, full part-time cohort, so I'm also starting at 8. So, thank you very much. Thanks. Okay. Oh, and I guess there's an audio recording.